Hello everyone, this video is in our Chess 960 series. I'm Grandmaster Matthew Sadler and we are going to be looking at the game between Komodo Dragon and Scorpio NN in the uh, TCEC uh, Chess 960 or Fisher Random Tournament that's uh, currently going on. Um, as always, uh, the engines find incredible things in uh, in Chess 960. They really manage to uh, exploit the unusual disposition of the uh, pieces in the starting position to maximum effect. Um, and well, you know, in the next uh, 20, 25 minutes, we're going to try and uh, understand what happened in this game, which was uh, a very fine game and very, very interesting. So as always, we just start off by reflecting on the uh, disposition of the forces in this uh, chess 960 position. It's number 764. Um, so both knights are centri centrally placed and they can develop to the classical outposts C3 and, uh, and F3. Um, however, if you develop there, um, this poses a problem for your bishops because uh, the bishop on B1, bishop on G1, um, well, the bishop on B1 is blocked. It can't uh, develop with uh, C3. Um, I mean, if you look at the position just with um, with classical eyes, um, a couple of things occur to you. Um, in particular, the idea of uh, e4, e5, um, knight e3. Um, and if you're just thinking about um, a sort of a Ray Lopez or, or Italian game, um, well, white often transfers the b1 knight in the classical chess to e3 through b1 to d2 to f1 to e3. And the light square bishop is often on this b1 h7 diagonal. It plays bishop f1 to b5 to a4, maybe to b3 and then to c2. And in the Italian game, it's often bishop c4, b3, c2. So, you know, actually, you know, just um, um, reasoning from that point of view, uh, 1 e4, 2 knight e3, and then c3 afterwards, it makes an awful lot of sense. Um... Now, what else makes uh, a lot of sense in the in the opening position? Um, I mean, always moves that um, uh, that open up uh, the lines of the diagonal pieces, the queen, the bishops, um, or moves that give scope to um, the major pieces, the rooks and the queens. These are always very um, you know possible and interesting uh, first moves. So, for example, um, f4 here would be uh, quite decent. Um, opening up the line of the bishop on g1 and also giving this rook access to uh, uh, the third rank. Um, you know, you're going to follow up with, um, with uh, you know, c3 or c4 uh, next move. Um, another interesting idea would be just to play h4. Um, this was uh, actually played quite famously by, by Magnus Carlsen against, um, uh, against uh, uh, Hikaru Nakamura in a Chess 960 game. Actually, it was uh, on the other side and um, uh, Magnus played A4. But the idea is to try and play H5 and um, um, actually just um, make this queen passive in the corner. And then, you know, if the game gets opened up, um, a passive queen can actually, um, well, cause lots of problems for the opponent. So quite interesting too. Um, in this game, Komodo Dragon, very strong uh, FRC player, played um, E4. Um, we got e5, keeping the symmetry, um, and now knight e3. So knight e3 actually contains just a little drop of poison. Um, this knight can, um, can come round to f5 or to d5 and threaten um, knight e7 checkmate. So uh, definitely something that, uh, that black has got to watch out for. Um, here Scorpio played um, um, a move that feels a little bit odd, um, played g6. I mean, it covers the, um, uh, the knight's invasion on f5, uh, activates the queen, uh, threatens f5, which will also, you know, make use of the rook on f8 and, um, uh, and also uh, free the bishop on g8. Um, the only thing is, it's just that, um, you know, white's always going to be quicker with stuff, um, simply because of having the first move. And white's ready to play f4, uh, for example, you know, open the f-file. And then, well, having played g6, uh, the kingside dark squares are going to be a little weak, you know, in particular uh, f6. So just a little bit nervous um, um, about this move, although it's not, you know, not a, um, a bad move by, uh, by any means. Um, letting my engines, uh, um, you know, um, Stockfish and Komodo, a dragon uh, loose on this one. They came up with a, a very interesting idea, which was uh, um, knight d6 attacking the pawn on e4, c3, and then a5. 
which is uh, definitely not what uh, <laughs> what you would uh, think of if you're thinking uh, classically. Um, I mean, I, I, me I mentioned it in the introduction, and um, um, again, in Fisher Random, you know, the um, um, the engines are, are very, very keen to uh, advance the pawns in front of the rooks. You know, give them access maybe to the third rank, but also using it as a as an easy way of um, of gaining space. And um, you know, I think one of the most impressive things about the Fisher Random play of the engines is that they're not just trying to reach uh, you know normal classical positions and then play from there. They're really trying to make the most of the unusual disposition of the forces. And uh, well, I think that's where we can learn so much from them. Uh, another point of a5 is that it frees the a7 square, so this bishop could also be developed to the a7 g1 diagonal, which might also be interesting. Just give you uh, an example of how a typical game continues. So g3, um, f6, uh, just supporting um, uh, the pawn on e5, and um, yeah, also activating this um, this bishop. And uh, the idea simply for black will be to develop the bishop there and then bring the queen out. You know, get the queen active without playing this weakening move g6. So make sure that the black king size structure remains firm. And uh, well, you do also notice some sort of intersection between the bishop on g8 and a pawn that moves to a4. Um, so those sort of thing, those two things sort of fit together a little bit. And uh, well, you can see how that worked out in um, in in some of my games here. Bishop c2, bishop a7, just activating the bishop on that diagonal. Uh, d3, a4, a3, um, knight c6, and for example here uh, after castles, bishop a2, knight f3, b5, knight d2, queen g8. And uh, yeah, playing the bishop out to the uh, uh, on the a two j diagonal, the queen gets active, and yeah, I mean black looks um, looks pretty good there. This was a Komodo dragon against stockfish in um, in one of my uh, engine matches. So um, yeah, pretty interesting way of developing, not at all standard, you know, and really making use of uh, of this you know very Fisher random uh, idea that uh, that engines use a lot, you know, really making use of um, of the uh, of, uh, of rooks to uh, to gain space and to uh, to free squares for development. So g6 was played, and now uh, Komodo played a very nice idea. Um, f4, e takes f4, not so remarkable. But now um, this move, knight d5, which uh, sort of makes me think of a Belgrade gambit. Um, that's uh, e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, knight c3, knight f6, d4, e, d, knight d5, which. Uh, Bizarrely enough, I analysed a lot at some stage because um, a guy from my Amersfoort chess club was uh, keen on it. So I uh, found a lot of interesting things, although it's you know, obviously not uh, particularly good. Um, the nice thing about knight d5 is that it threatens knight e7 mate. Yeah, those are the sort of things that can happen in, uh, in, uh, in uh, chess 960. And black is forced to play knight c6. And then, well, you know, what do you notice about this? You notice that this knight on d5 is sort of invulnerable, can't be chased away by a pawn, by a pawn on c6 because the knight's been forced to c6. And that's pretty nice, really. I mean, this knight on d5 attacking f6, you know, still eyeing uh, e7, and, you know, we're going to be able to play c3 and d4 behind it, probably. Um, uh, now, actually, with its next move, Komodo Dragon is going to belie that, uh, <laughs> that, uh, those thoughts a little bit. But, um, uh, yeah, I mean, this does look quite attractive. And actually, um, in my engine games, I thought that Stockfish came up with a great idea here, which was to play g3. Um, so, um, activates the queen, obviously. Queen gets out of the corner, supports uh, e4 and d5. And you're just really just trying to make this um, um, a gambit to, um, uh, to open up the f-file and, um, yeah, just keep this knight on, uh, on d5. So, um, yeah, if you just um, uh, take the pawn, um, I play this move bishop c5, d6, bishop e3. We'll talk about this move bishop c5 later because it comes across all over the park. And um, I have to say that intuitively, I would think that d6 would be a useful move for uh, for black. But I'm sort of reasoning from, yeah, from how it feels and looks classically. So uh, good to have a look at that. Um, uh, but anyway, f5, bishop h6, knight g7, hg. And now this very typical uh, thing that happens, um, takes, takes. Um, so black feels that it has to uh, take the knight off. Um, but what happens there is that, you know, white gets a great outpost on e6 for its pieces. And even more than that, it's very hard now for black to develop the bishop on the um, on the b8 h2 diagonal. I mean, look at the number of pawns in the way. If you go here, you're really weakening your king. So you can try and get the bishop active on the a7 g1 diagonal. 
But then look what happens here. We get in d4, and this bishop has got absolutely nothing to do. Now, you know, Komodo was still uh, managing to make um, uh, a draw against Stockfish, you know, in, uh, in this position, more often than not. But it is quite difficult. I wouldn't fancy this at all with black. This is a very nice idea, this g3, you know, playing very, very actively, um, trying to, um, to clamp down on black, really exploiting the weaknesses of the dark squares. I think it's sort of a very, very nice idea. Um, Komodo played um, more calmly, just with uh, knight takes f4, but feels a little bit of a shame, really. You know, you get a, a great knight on d5, and then you just remove it from there. But, yeah, okay. Um, so f5 played, e takes f5. And now, um, uh, um, yeah, we're going to see, um, I've talked about the idea of bishop c5 to force uh, d6. Well, now we get it from black. Um, in all fairness, you know, I mean, um, rook takes f5 here, you know, which would be a human move and then something maybe like rook f7 you know this looks sort of all right for uh for black you know i mean um uh uh you know the pieces are a bit weird because it's fisher random but you know you don't have the feeling that um that black's so far behind in development has got so many problems that he won't be able to cope why it's a little bit better um what do we get we've got takes takes h4 h6 rook f3 Bishop h7, nice uh, development, knight here. a5, bishop d4, queen g8. Um, queen h3, rook e7. It's all a little bit odd, but um, uh, the pieces feel a little bit weird. But it's not, um, you know, critical for uh, for black. And white's pieces are a little bit, um, yeah, you know, they'll still need some work, basically, to get uh, active. And, of course, casting queen side is impossible because of queen takes a2. Um, so this sort of thing would be natural. What uh, Scorpio did was something that, uh, you know, only engines can come up with, really. Um, but the, you know, the, the positional point behind is quite interesting. He played bishop c4, d3, and then bishop g8. Just two tempi in order to force the pawn to d3. And, um, you know, just from uh, looking at it with, with classical chess eyes, you know, d3 is always a good move for white if you got it for free. I mean, it would develop a bishop that's on c1. But yeah, you've got to sort of let that go, um, you know, step past um, your normal thoughts about about moves and uh, just look at the position itself. And of course, you know what, um, when the pawn moves to d3, it means that the bishop is going to find it harder to get activated on the on the b1, h7 diagonal. And also, you know, it's the king on c1 here. So, you know, the weaknesses here around the dark squares are, um, um, you know, might prove to be significant, in particular the weakness of the c1, h6 diagonal. And, um, well, I mean, um, uh, I suppose the Im important thing is, you know, what would happen after fg? Well, black plays knight d4 here. And, um, well, it's just, um, you know, tactics really. But um, rook f4 followed by knight e2 check, or even the immediate knight e2 check, is actually quite a nasty uh, threat for uh, for white. And it's, um, so, I mean, um, what do you do? You take on h7 maybe, you take on d4, g3, queen check, c6 getting the bishop active and attacking the knight on f4. And um, yeah, I mean, again, this is not, it's not completely intuitive for, to me that uh, the black's got sufficient compensation for two pawns, but the engines are, are already at uh, zero, zero, zero. Um, I mean, we've got the weak h2 pawn, a little bit difficult for white to get um, properly developed. Um, after d4, queen a5, you know, we're attacking a2, so you, it's a little bit hard to get castle queen side. And somehow, um, yeah, we just end up uh, getting one pawn back and uh, yeah this position is uh, um, yeah just not enough for uh, for white to convert um, yeah you know not 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 obvious somehow you know and um, and uh, not so easy but uh, you know a very interesting idea and um, uh, a theme that's coming back all the time in the um, in the engine play and we're going to see it a, a lot in the game after bishop g8 um, white played I think a very nice idea played g4 um, and we're going to see the idea is uh, not to exchange off pawns, but to try and uh, extract a, uh, an advantage from, uh, from the way Black's done this. So um, a5, yeah, what can you say? Um, uh, obviously a human would play uh, g takes f5. Uh, the engine calculates that, um, uh, you know, this idea f takes g6. H takes g6 is, uh, is fine. We've got um, still some problems with the, um, with the knight on, uh, on f4 there. Um, so, uh, um, you know, this position is, is fine for black. 
not easy for a human to calculate um, but in this position we include a5 and a4 and then we carry on with uh, with normal normal events so you know that's just uh, just one of those things you've got to live with with engines that they can um, you know they can try and extract the very most out of the position you know the absolute hundred percent just because they're able to uh, calculate lines like this so easily but you know I mean uh, uh, the basic contours are the same so it doesn't really matter too much for uh, our understanding of the game I mean why would you want to play a5 um, quite useful to uh, to get to be able to put the rook on the third rank might be able to play bishop a7 just get some space in general for the uh, for the king but after g takes f5, um, white plays g5 here. And uh, the first uh, interesting position to, uh, to look at, because, um, you know, this position's got some sort of recognisable local features, you know, even if, um, you know, the way the pieces are still looks uh, a little bit confusing. I mean, we've got, um, um, black's got an isolated pawn, and it's beautifully blockaded by a knight on, on f4, which we can, you know, reinforce in, uh, in many ways. So we've got a great blockade there, and yeah, knight in front of a pawn, perfect square for it. You know, the knight exerts influence on all sorts of... Uh, um, central and kingside squares. I mean, also, white's really got a good opportunity just to create um, a pass pawn. I mean, in the ending, this is going to be, you know, really important. So, uh, in principle, I like white, uh, you know, in this in this uh, position. However, what you've got to realise is the um, the advantages that white's got, you know, more on the king side. They're quite a way away from the black king, so it's not like there's immediate danger. Uh, and of course, you've got enough firepower on the king side to hold back any immediate attempt to create um, um, a pass pawn. So um, um, yeah, I mean it's not um, it's not crucial yet for uh, for black, but you're going to need to uh, you know you, you've got some time now to find a good way of developing, but you, you need to find it. Uh, now we start getting um, you know some some excellent uh, tactics coming in, um, which I'll, I'll show you. Um, what Scorpio did was was quite sensible. Um, I mean, the idea really is that um, uh, rather than putting the bishop to a7, you'd really like to get the bishop on this diagonal, because when you get the bishop on this diagonal, it's attacking the knight on f4. It's really you know it's starting to fight with with white for. Um, uh, um, for you know one of the best things of, of, of white's position so you know it's going to cause some problems for white going to force white to, um, uh, uh, to 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 you know to show something to uh, to maintain its advantage um, now what you could do knight e7 is very very tempting um, just to go c6 but here um, bishop c5 was the response and um, very, very interesting. Um, uh, if you go d6, then the evaluation of my engines jumps, you know, like one, one point or something like that. So, uh, you know, it goes to plus 1.8 or something. Quite amazing. I mean, again, you know, we, we've talked a little bit about it. What about it in this context? Why is it so serious for, uh, for black? Well, this pawn on d6... Um, obviously, it's blocking the bishop on b8. So after c6, the bishop will be um, will be blocked. Now, I mean, what you could do, bishop b3, you could, of course, go c6. Let's go c3. And then d5 to open up the line of this bishop. Um, however, um, what that's doing then is it's blocking in this bishop on g8. Um, and, um, you know, that that's not terribly critical in itself however if you look at the rest of black's kingside pawn structure you've got the bishop restricted by the pawn on f5 and pawn on h7 and you've also got this knight on f4 which is taking away squares like uh, e6 from the bishop so actually you know what you're saying is that when you go uh, d6 to activate this bishop properly you're going to have to go c6 and d5 c6 and d5 but then it'll make this bishop uh, passive so just you know forcing this move d6 it, it doesn't really make much sense of uh, of black's position whereas um you know obviously the move that you want to play is you want to play c6 activate this bishop without blocking the diagonal of this bishop that's what you really want now obviously uh, c6 is uh, completely impossible because it just drops the um the knight on e7 haha <laughs> well wrong wrong uh yeah <laughs> i mean i i have to say you know when i saw c6 played i um um i did sort of uh, do a double take and uh you know stared at the position for a number of seconds before i i said but is that what he wants um and amazingly yes bishop takes f4 check and queen e5 is the idea forking these two but of course after bishop f8 queen f4 check king d1 i mean white's just a piece up right and i mean look at those black pieces 
uh, it doesn't feel like um, like Black's got you know any sort of huge counterplay here. But um, you know what have we got here? Bishop f7, threatening Bishop h5 check, c4, Knight c7. All looks so slow. Bishop g7, and then this amazing idea, Knight d5. Um, what's the idea of that? Takes Bishop h5 check, Queen f2 check. King b3, bishop f7, looking for an old bishop d5, forking the queen and the king. I mean, it's amazing tactics, right? I mean, I can't, uh, um, you know, just completely beyond me, really. Um, I wouldn't be able to do this at all. I mean, the game continued, takes, takes, queen c5 check, king c1, white gives back one piece, the f pawn marches, and uh, yeah, this turns out to be um, approximate balance in the... Uh, in the position i mean just quite amazing the one thing you've got to got to realize as well is that um after d4 check f2 bishop d3 black's got this queenside castling still where the rook becomes active and um yeah this massive f pawn just uh um, and also you know white's somewhat uncoordinated pieces compensates for the uh for the piece and this was a dragon against a stockfish game uh, of mine so quite amazing you know quite amazing but um yeah the tactics you can't hope to see um but um the, the idea is uh, i think very good the positional idea and what you're actually looking for so well scorpio did it um less tactically i mean it played knight g7 and the idea is simply well we play knight e7 and after bishop c5 we'll just have rook e8 just to defend the knight no problem so knight g7 c3 knight e7 knight e g2 reinforcing the knight knight e6 uh, from black just uh, attacking the knight and here white takes an interesting decision plays takes takes and then h4 so um just uh taking the pawn um yeah changing the pawn structure this pawn is now defended but we've got a couple of uh, we've got this target on the um on the uh, uh e file and yeah we might be able to start playing d4 and really start um uh yeah, clamping down on that uh, on those central dark squares, um, and then if we manage to play a move like d4 and then knight f4, then um, yeah, I mean the knight's not just blockading the pawn in f5; it's also got a target on um, on e6. And yeah, I mean here this is where um, um, I think Scorpio made quite a big mistake. Um, I mean c6 was really the move that you're expecting right I mean you've moved the knight away from e7 so let's get this bishop on here it defends e5 attacks f4 it feels like it's in contact with all the right points um, you know white plays bishop c5 rook e8 knight e3 and then um, h6 was played in a stockfish against dragon game uh, queen g2 bishop c7 bishop d4 e5 Bishop c5 takes takes bishop d8 I mean you know black's under under pressure here I mean uh, that is absolutely true but um but somehow yeah I don't know I mean it feels uh, a little bit more um um a little bit more um uh yeah like 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 black's getting the pieces in the right place really you know but it's um I think um you know again it's one of those situations where the the engines draw it and uh, you sort of say oh okay well it was still uh, still fine then but yeah it's looking a little bit uncomfortable already but this is more really what i would be looking for from uh, from black i mean bishop a7 was played and then we get takes takes and d4 and um you know we're starting to move really towards a position that uh, could come from classical chess and um basically we've got um uh, a much nicer pawn structure for white very weak uh, dark squares central kingside uh, dark squares white's you know looking to clamp down on them uh, and black's rooks are quite uncoordinated here um white's got the possibility for um yeah uh, uh, a pass pawn on in the um in the uh, in the ending you know and well these minor pieces are not so fantastic i mean the bishop on g8 restricted by the pawn on e6 you could free it with e5 but then the pawn on f5 will be weak and uh, I mean, really, this is one of the very nice things about running a series of, uh, of engine games, you know, from positions in the game. And, you know, until this moment, then, um, you know, my, my big engines, Komodo and uh, Dragon and uh, Stockfish, they were holding the, the draw for black, you know, um, uh, up till now. But somewhere around here, you get a sea change and um, uh, suddenly, you know, they both start, all the winds start coming uh, to white. You know, maybe Stockfish uh, holds the occasional one, but 
you know, basically whites uh, winning loads and loads of these games. So, um, uh, it, yeah, it really looks like it's quite difficult. And I, I mean, I suppose that, you know, the key thing is, is that these two pieces really find it hard to um, to find a good spot. Um, this bishop never finds a, a solid outpost. Um, and this knight, once black plays e5 to free its bishop, n somehow finds it difficult to move away from e7 because the, the f5 pawn is weak. So let's have a look at how that happened. e5 takes rook a6, getting the rook active, bishop c2, bishop c4, rook f2, just uh, uh, getting out of the attack there, queen e5 and castles. And um, yeah, this is looking pretty normal now. We're just going to go knight f4, queen e1, um, and then start uh, pushing the uh, pushing the kingside pawns, creating a pass pawn. And somewhere along the line, this bishop is going to get tactically vulnerable. It's either going to have to go back to passivity on g8, or it's going to get knocked and hit somewhere. So h6, um, you know, black's basically trying to uh, create some uh, distractions here. Black doesn't want to sit around and let white improve its position. Easier to think of moves to improve white's position than it is to improve black's. Um, so queen e1 played, rook e6 takes takes, g takes h6. That's just a temporary pawn sacrifice, but um, now we've got this, um, uh, yeah, th this uh, very nice past h pawn for white. Rook fd2, b6, knight f4, rook h6 and h5. And this doesn't look so bad for black. I mean, you know, material's equal. But just, um, you know, this knight f4 defends the pawn on h5. This knight's incredibly solid. It just can't be, a, can't be got at. I mean, the rook on e5 has got very limited mobility anyway. And um, it can't come to e4. The knight can't come to g6 or to d5. You know, we're threatening rook d8. We've also got rook g1 to g7 as possible invasion. And yeah, this bishop is just loose and hanging. Um, so... Yeah, a, a very actually quite an unpleasant position for uh, for Black to defend. And um, what uh, Komodo does in the next few moves is, um, um, without you know, sort of making concrete progress, you'd say it tests out its um, all its invasion possibilities. Um, you're going to see what uh, what happens, and eventually Black feels it has to uh, to take some sort of action, and then Komodo sort of uh, snaps the trap shut. So King B7. Rook g1, looking to go uh, rook g7. Rook h7, bishop d1. Nice little move there. Um, so uh, um, the bishop can come round to f3. So rook e4 allows bishop f3. Um, and the bishop's protecting the pawn. Maybe the knight could think about moving away. Um, king c8, rook dg2. Um, so yeah, very typical engine play. You know, rook e4 is possible here. But then we just go back rook f2. And then we go bishop c2. And everything's back to normal. No damage done. Um, yeah, just, uh, um, yeah. Black, just, wow, that was, uh, that's a game. Oh, that's slow chess against Vajolet. So slow chess uh, um, seemingly making good inroads there. So, um, uh, so rook dg2, king d8. And, um, you know, black's getting very worried about white invading with rook g7, getting rid of this um, uh, rook on h7. And then with this rook res restricted, you know, the h pawn is just a runner. So the king runs over to, uh, to e8 just to try and interfere with that. And now, yeah, white just goes back. Rook d1, bishop d5, rook d2, c6, c4. And now makes use of the d-file. And, uh, well, before the king could sort of hide away on b7. But now the king's um, a little bit in the firing line on uh, on f7. And rook 1 d6. And I have to say that, uh, you know, um, uh, I mean, obviously, you know, black's under pressure. White's got uh, an initiative. But, um, I, I mean, I, I ran <laughs> tens of, uh, of engine games in this position. Because, you know, somehow black's king is, uh, you know, a little bit under pressure. It's in the firing line. But um, uh, it's got quite a few squares available. And I was sort of thinking, you know, you know, really, I mean, are, are you really sure that, um, that, that white's got enough to... Um, uh, you know, to, to, to really cause problems for the black king. And, uh, you know, why, you know, is this really enough for the plus three or plus four that, uh, that Komodo was, uh, was putting, maybe even more, actually? Um, I mean, the key point is, is that we've got this restriction of the black king. And there's also um, lots of little tactical points. I mean, first of all, we've got um, this fork on E5 of the uh, king on F7 and loose bishop on C4. That's uh, a big problem. Um, and then we've also got um, some seventh rank uh, checks 
which would pick up a, roos, a, a loose rook on um, on h7. And um, yeah, these sort of tactics, you know, allied, you know, just in general to um, all the, th you know, the, the stuff that White's got. Um, yeah, that just seems to tip the balance and, and, and push it into a just winning position for White. But it's not, you know, it's not easy calculation at all. No, for the engines, it's easy. But from a human point of view, it's not easy at all. Um, so, um, for example, if I, if I went rook e1 check in this position, king d2, rook f1, I go knight g6, and I've got two threats here. I'm threatening uh, knight e5 check, picking up the bishop on c4, and I'm also threatening knight e7, king e7, rook d7 check, picking up the rook on h7. Very, very difficult. Yeah, can't do anything about it, basically. So bishop d5 played, which is in principle a decent move. Keep the rook on, on e5, you know, keeping control of that uh, e5 square and, and defending the knight on e7. And yeah, make the bishop strong again. Um, rook a8. So just giving white some flexibility there, all the time in the world, looking for maybe rook a7 and then rook dd7 or knight g6 at some stage. So that rook on um, on e5 is going to get into a bit of trouble if we don't do anything. So I can go king d2 and then hit it, and then the rook might not have um, any good spot to go to. So black goes rook e1 check and rook h1, and now we get knight g6. And um, uh, yeah, all the tactics work for uh, for um, uh, for white, and actually they're not even difficult it's just a couple of moves it's just uh as i said for me just um uh thinking oh yeah that that really is very good for uh for 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 white it, it takes a little bit of uh, of thought somehow so rook one rook, rook takes h5 knight e5 king g7 i go rook a7 and uh yeah this knight on e7 is 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 kind of uh in trouble here i mean um the only move i've got is king h8 and then i go rook d8 check bishop g8 um, if I go knight g8, you might well spot the lovely knight g6 checkmate. Very nice. But after bishop g8, I just go rook e7, takes knight g6, win a piece, play knight takes c7, and uh, just a total win for uh, for white. Simple, and yet somehow I find it difficult to visualize. Rook 7, h5 is exactly the same. Rook a7 again, and you're just going to pick up this knight on e7. There's no way you can protect it king there I've just got rook d8 check and the king has to leave the uh, defense of the knight so beautiful really you know really very nice but um yeah just uh quite surprising to me uh, somehow just looking at the position you know wasn't uh, intuitive at all that all these uh, uh, obvious ideas for black were, were not working at all so rook h2 check king c3 b5 from um from black there um and um, uh, yeah, after this, actually, um, Black's position is just collapsing, right? I mean, all these all these pieces are loose, and um, well, Komodo chose the uh, the most accurate way to go for it. B4, Knight C6. This was a lovely moment. Um, the key point is that um, uh, it's a, a little trap here because if Rook E5, we go Rook D2 check. That is the key point. And, um, well, if the king goes to c5, it's rook takes c2 check. If the king goes to e6, we can no longer play rook e7. So white just played this move, bishop d3, putting the uh, the bishop on prise. Um, if I go rook d2, I've just got king takes c5. Ha ha. Knight d3 allows rook e7 check. Um, for example, king h8, rook d8, checkmate. So rook h3 played, but now bishop f5. Different way of attacking the bishop on d3 but allows this uh, fork, very painful fork, which bishop f5, and obviously, absolutely everything is collapsing, takes, takes, and, uh, well, these pawns and black's king were not long for this world. So, um, there we are, you know, um, quite a long video, do apologise for that, um, but I, you know, I hope it was um, it was instructive, and I hope we're, you know, sort of uh, getting to grips a little bit with uh, with typical ideas in uh, in Fisher Random there. Um, you know, it is really crucial, though. You know, the way that you develop, um, and um, you know, what particularly struck me was uh, Knight D5 uh, in this position. You know, forcing uh, a Knight to C6, and then afterwards this Knight on D5. You know, just proves to be uh, um, a huge burden for Black's position, and uh, you know. Um, uh, in the end really it turned out that for black's position you needed to have this bishop active on this diagonal and somehow you know after that uh, this early fourth move black never really got to grips with that and uh, um, yeah and the position just got uh, just got worse and worse but very good game from uh, from Komodo not spectacular but just uh, quality all the way through 
All right then, well, I hope you enjoyed that video. If you're still listening, even to the end, why not give me a like or a subscribe to the channel? Um, even take a look at um, my new book, The Silicon Road to Chess Improvement, which is full of fantastic engine stuff, analysis, and then a huge number of, um, uh, of tips, huge section on that uh, for how to train with engines, all sorts of uh, innovative and interesting ways that I use you know, to, um, uh, to improve my game by using engines. But otherwise, thanks very much for watching. Have a great Christmas and New Year and hopefully see you at the next video.